Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's Maka um, Radze. Uh, I will present myself soon and also present the whole idea of this webinars, the participants of the webinars, the speakers. Uh, first, let me share my screen uh, where I can uh, show you some of the things that um, we have been doing. So I work in the University of Foggia as an assistant professor, and my specialty is technology-enhanced learning. In this presentation, first, I will uh, present the webinar content, and I will present the participants, the speakers. Then I will present the Project Bridges, which is coordinated by my university. Mm -hmm. Then I will discuss the actual uh, talk, the, the main subject of my speech and uh, conceptualizations. The main idea is to problematize technology and pedagogy connection. And I will also present uh, Bridges MOOC, where you can learn much more about these issues, uh, which was specifically developed uh, within the project. So uh, Project Bridges is an Erasmus project uh, which is uh, which was actually financed within the frame of the digital education call that was introduced during the uh, lockdowns uh, because the European Commission thought that it was very much needed to work exactly on the topic of uh, digital education. Uh, so we started uh, by researching pandemic experiences in higher education institutions in Europe, and we have several countries involved, Italy, Spain, um, Turkey, the UK, and Slovenia here. Uh, which is represented by the partners like Wittlisayan University, University of Foggia, Wonderful Education from Italy, Josef Stefan Institute from Slovenia, Oktedra Editorial from uh, Spain, and Southampton University from uh, the UK. Uh, so uh, after we have researched these experiences uh, to actually understand and we took this experience as some kind of an experiment that was done on a massive scale, we created a faculty development framework which was used to build the digital hub and the MOOC also that we are going to, it was already launched and we are going to present today to you. Uh, we also are creating, it's underway, uh, a digital hub with resources, specific resources where you can go, you can see the tools which are contextualized and um, sort of described in which kind, which kind of uh, context you can use these tools. Uh, and uh, also the theoretical bits which talks about not only uh, digital education frameworks for, uh, per se, like how can you use digital tools, but also neurocognitive approaches, how you can uh, tackle issues such as Zoom fatigue, for instance, or uh, cognitive load, or some other very interesting uh, specific topics. And then we created, this This is one of the activities of our project where we are trying to share our experience, what we have learned, and uh, specifically presenting topics that is also in some ways discussed in the MOOC. So, uh, to uh, present the participants, and uh, you have seen what is the main uh, topic, uh, and the focus of the webinars is to reflect on the pandemic experiences and uh, discuss the main uh, concepts, not only in the field of technology enhanced learning and educational technologies, but also theories, pedagogies, tools, and also some cognitive uh, processes behind learning, which uh, is a separate uh, subject. The webinar series, as I said, takes place within the frame of Erasmus Project Bridges. So today it's me, Maka Eradze, uh, and Dr. Nick Fair and Dr. Amiel Telmiel uh, discussing with you three different topics. I will uh, overview the field and I will focus and problematize the connection of tools and pedagogies. Uh, Dr. Fair will focus on post-digital learning theories and pedagogies. 
and Dr. Amial will talk about authoring tools and they will also talk about themselves, so they will present themselves also. Uh, after which we will uh, have a discussion on pandemic experiences and post-pandemic futures and everybody is welcome to participate in this discussion. And overall, we have three webinars planned. Uh, after this webinar, you will automatically receive the certificates of attendance within two, three days. The other two are planned. Now we don't have the date, but these are basics of educational sciences and practical use of tools. So uh, I am uh, specialized in technology enhanced learning, or then I will discuss these notions in the field. There are different notions, right? Uh, we call it e-learning, we call it distance learning, we call it, these are different things, but uh, those uh, notions were used in, uh, in the, during the pandemic interchangeably, right? Uh, so I will not discuss it in, in much detail, but I will talk about this. Uh, so, um, uh, Dr. Nick Fair is from the University of Southampton and a senior researcher uh, engineer in the uh, university. Uh, Dr. Talamial is coming from the Joseph Stefan Institute and uh, he's an adjunct professor at the School of Education at the University of Brazil, where he coordinates the UNESCO Chair on Distance Education. So, um, I'll start. Um, with problematizing the actual notion. This is one of the notions, technology enhanced learning, which is used mostly in Europe. Uh, I, I would say maybe in continental Europe. And there is even an association of technology enhanced learning a conference, which is associated with it, a very big conference. And if you notice this, uh, enhancing something. What do we enhance? How do we enhance? And why do we enhance? So um, I would like to problematize the term in, in a ways where we are already trying to put and load this word with automatically enhancing. So if we introduce tools, they automatically enhance something. Is it so? If we introduce a new tool, does it improve practice? Or maybe in some cases it, it might make a, uh, create a problem for me. Or does it provide access, which we, we have seen also during the pandemic times, because the tools enabled uh, the access, the mere access to education, but was it done in a proper way? Uh, the something that has been uh, introduced was also the term of uh, emergency pedagogy, uh, emergency remote teaching, that was basically uh, a term denoting the lack of pedagogy and the design. But is the design a problem? Is the tools problem? So what is pedagogy in general? The, it can be defined in a different way but this is something that uh, is coming from Greek and means leading. So right now we are using it as a sort of a teaching, but it comes from leading, so leading a process. Uh, right now we understand the teaching profession in some ways as a designer. We are, pro we are focused on designing something. So what happened during the pandemic is, was actually the lack of design. Why? Because there was no time to design things. So some of the uh, faculty, some of the professors, now our project is about higher education, they tried to redesign on the, after the, some kind of uh, experience they have gained. But the ma more major problem with uh, pandemic experiences was the lack of design. This is what it has been actually said. So then what is technology? This is the uh, sort of an, uh, what you will find uh, in Google when you search for it. So the technology can be something that is uh, intangible and also tangible, right? 
technology is an application of scientific knowledge by practical purposes, uh, for practical purposes. So technology can be something that is conceptual, but it can be also tangible. In this way, we now have tools that are digital. So they're not tangible, but they have some kind of a shape. They do things. These are not only concepts. Uh, the thing is that the technologies change the reality. Now, how do they change? Probably you have seen this uh, picture. And uh, when I teach uh, about digital teaching and learning uh, to my students, I often refer to this picture and I ask them, what do you think this is? So this is a view of, from a futurist, Jean-Marc Cotet, how, they, how, how he saw the 2000, year 2000, in the context of teaching and learning. So you see books come down to the machine and it is connected and uh, all the knowledge is transferred to the heads of the children. Uh, the thing is that uh, what I want to underline is that did we actually change our attitudes towards it? Are we expecting technology to just create some kind of miraculous machines that can help put the knowledge into the heads of the teachers, the uh, students, whether it is possible and how can we do it? It seems like very simple and simplistic uh, concepts that I'm touching, but these are very fundamental questions. Is it possible? Or have we changed our attitudes, like in the chat GPT uh, era, where we are talking all about chat GPT and what it can change, and what we have, for instance, it will revolutionize the assessment because in the context of university teaching, because now we cannot ask to students to produce uh, papers and essays, and that is not the way to assess them because they will just ask ChatGPT, but we know that it has its own problems. And we are going back to the same issue, I think, to this view, because technologies are not going to replace teachers. This is what I believe, and this is not going to happen. So uh, the first technology, now we, have, we are in the era where we have so much technology for education. Uh, where we don't know what to do with it anymore. And sometimes these tools are not even used by teachers. We design them, but we, they're not actually what we say the problem of adoption. Is this a problem? And how do we design? So uh, sort of an problematizing the design as uh, learning activities and design of tools. Uh, the first alphabet or the first scripture or how to write uh, was not invented for education. It was for bureaucrat bureaucratic purposes in Mesopotamia, right? So the first actual technology that was invented for education was the chalk and the blackboard. And this was it. Then in the new era, we have so many tools where we don't even use them or we don't know how to contextualize them in the practice. Uh, and then we have these uh, so many notions in the field uh, between the spaces, the traditional education, what we call the traditional ed education. And during the pandemic, there was a big clash between the traditional education and distance learning. So uh, from one hand, we have technology which uh, creates some opportunities for teaching because they change the practice because uh, new tools create new social technical regimes. Then we have the internet that uh, further creates opportunities to spread more information. Then we have different spaces. And we have also the synchronicity and asynchronicity uh, sort of mode of delivery which can be seen on the continuum. So the further you go on the continuum for asynchronous teaching, you need more to design and it requires quite financial and human resources. So that was one of the issues why during the pandemic we couldn't 
uh, let ourselves to maybe go asynchronous because that needs tripulation. So everybody became more synchronous, they, that was more synchronous. While, for instance, distance education uh, was not necessarily synchronous. Distance education exists for centuries already as a concept, and it didn't mean that everything was the, on the internet or with the tools even. Then we have something that has to do with actual tools. So on the uh, crossing of these different traditional education, distance learning and educational technologies, we have emerging uh, notions as online learning, e-learning, uh, technology enhanced learning, educational technologies. Here, what we are talking about educational technologies, what we mean is the educational tools. By technology enhanced learning, we mostly mean that we are trying to combine pedagogy and technology in a way that it enhances the education. So uh, then we have spaces. Something that is possible in traditional education cannot be done in distance education on, with, on the internet or with tools. But at the same time, something that can be done with tools cannot be done in traditional education. So this mix of spaces creates some new opportunities and new realities and new social technical regimes. So what is the promise of educational technologies? How do we see it? Like us, who is coming from this field, improvement and enhancement um, of teaching and learning practices Digitization, we shouldn't forget that it also has not so hidden agenda to digitize and create digital competencies because uh, if we have younger generation, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have these digital competencies. If you see the European uh, Digicomp uh, framework, for instance, it's quite complex and it doesn't necessarily contain only the operational use of tools. Then we want to change the practice, innovate. So once we say a new tool, we think that it's already an innovation. Is it so? During the pandemic, the main promise of uh, tools was actually the securing access to education. What are the expectations? Technology use often is completed with the application of technology in other fields where outcomes are more straightforward and can be anticipated. While in the field of learning, there are so many, if we, if we want to mention like more scientific concepts, there are so many variables and you cannot really control for the variables. The context is always changing. So one tool in one context can change something. So you design and then you can achieve something, but it's not guaranteed. Expected impact and effect is never guaranteed in different across different contexts. So context matters. Then we have dichotomy between distance technology enhanced learning, which was conflated during the pandemic, like the distance education meant uh, necessarily technology enhanced learning because distance education is more about access, and then we called it emergency remote teaching, and then technology enhanced learning specifically targets for improved practice and innovation. Uh, expected change of practice. Do we enter the existing uh, scene uh, with new tools and that does, does it mean that we already changed practice? What do technology, what does technology bring? Like if we're using problem-based learning that is not necessarily for technology enhanced learning, this is not a, something that was born within the new tools. And uh, so there is this kind of a theory, theory, pedagogy and the tool balance. Uh, then we have a uh, design side where we have the design of learning as learning activities and then we have the design of tools which tell us what we can do with these tools. So every designer has some kind of uh, affordances embedded in it or some kind of attribution to, to a tool that this tool can do something. However, then we have learning designs and different contexts and then how do these tools actually communicate. Uh, 
trying to manage and guarantee the outcomes through careful design is sort of a, an instrumentalist approach. We are trying to create a problem solve. So it, it in the end becomes a problem solving activity. And education is, as I said, context dependent. And uncertainty and of the contextualized use of ed tech is educational technologies like the tools is often disregarded. So then we go to one stance that technology creates opportunity and changes the reality by itself, which is the most used notion like uh, from Gibson, Norman, uh, the affordance is that Gibson used it in a different way than Norman has used it in a different way. This is not something we are not going to problematize. Another stance is integration of technology is a supportable and targeted way, like like doctor's prescription. You have a design, it will work. Balance. Technology is not a panacea. Technology is a way to achieve learning goals and outcomes through design. So sort of a uh, technology-driven approaches and pedagogy-driven approaches, we have all heard about these. Old-fashioned way is this Marshall McLuhan's medium is the message. Actually, it is also a message, but then it's more subtle than that, right? While the reality uh, during the pandemic, what we saw is that uh, actually the pandemic created opportunities to experiment and closely observe the practice on a massive scale. So we saw what can be done, what it can do, what, whether it actually creates innovation by itself, etc. The integration of technologies into practice and educational innovation is the reorganizing matter and subtle dance between tools and pedagogies, design and ins instantiation. So the uh, actual outcome cannot be always guaranteed. That is why copying traditional teaching in modern technological spaces is not often working and solutionism. Uh, so-called solution is that I have a problem, then I have a tool, then I can solve this problem is not always the case. Uh, thinking about the contest and not just the tool is very important. Uh, there is this um, approach that I would like to underline, and I'm going to finish very soon, is this entangled pedagogy sort of notion. Uh, which sees uh, pedagogy and tools together. So tech doesn't drive pedagogy. This is uh, labeled as an illusion. Or pedagogy doesn't drive tech. The actual uh, idea is that it's a mutual shaping of purpose, context, values, methods, and tech. So they work together. You have a tool, you sort of play with it, and you see its potential. And then you maybe design something with this tool in mind, but this tool also has some kind of design. So you sort of repurpose it. And then you achieve some outcomes in certain context. The context is different than changing, and you need reorganizing here. So here, the ending uh, of my presentation is, uh, the announcement of the MOOC that has been launched uh, already, and it's about the actual balance between the theory and because we researched and actually uh, Nick and also maybe will talk about this uh, in more detail, we understood that education, the university professors do not really have time to go and really learn new theories. So, here in this um, MOOC, what we did is that we are giving very practical base to use. Like here you have the cognitive approaches, you have neurosciences bits that you will need, you have uh, problematization also as innovate, what is innovation, what kind of theory and frameworks you can use, and a very practical examples of tools, how can you, you use these tools. So the theory bits are very uh, bite-sized, uh, and then the general hub organized around it also ensures that you are able to use the tools and then you have the descriptions for these tools within the hub. 
So you need something, you go, you learn about something, and then you can see how these two can be contextualized. So it's sort of an aggregator. Uh, from one side, you have a MOOC, and from the other, you have a hub where you can uh, experiment with tools. So uh, thank you for your attention. Now I'm going to hand uh, uh, Nick Fair will continue uh, the discussion with his um, post-digital uh, theories and pedagogies. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Maka. Um, very interesting. And we had lots of uh, uh, interesting questions come into the chat. Yeah, um, I, I see. It's really, I couldn't see these questions and it's really interesting. I'll no, try I don't know to... if you want to, while well, I start sharing my screen and so on, I don't know if you want to sort of scan back through them and, and see if there's anything there. I mean, I think ChatGPT obviously has caused lots of interest. <laughs> But we had a very interesting question from Matilda that perhaps you could address where she asks about the tension between the sort of human rights of education uh, and, and free education and the technologies being owned and controlled by business interests, companies, people looking to make money. So do you see or, or would you like to just spend a couple of moments thinking or, or, or talking to Matilda about uh, about this tension between open and free mm -hmm. and and uh, sort of owned by profit-making businesses. Uh, just while I get my screen set up, that might be helpful. Well, yeah, that's a very big issue. And it like looks like the, the uh, dichotomy between uh, the actually the business-driven, the market uh, economy environment, and then what is the public and the private sector, right? So this is something that we cannot really solve. But what we have, for instance, in uh, Europe, it's uh, very open access, is very much supported. So uh, this is something that is very interesting and also uh, Tal will talk about. However, we live in the, this kind of a, uh, this is our economical model. We cannot just uh, tell uh, businesses not to create tools. I know this is a very big issue and this is a business it's not only something that I do. For instance, in the field of um, uh, technology-enhanced learning and educational technologies, there are different ways they call it. Uh, PhD students, for instance, develop some different tools and then they, or uh, projects, for instance, in the European Union, they develop some tools. Uh, it's about, oh, it's about uh, how do you, use these tools and i don't see necessarily that it's a bad issue if the business is there because this is the economy that we live in so this is very problematic but uh i don't know i i don't have an answer to this great thanks maka um and as i say there's more there's questions popping in and out of the chat so i was trying to respond to them during your bit maybe you could just keep a little eye on them during my bit and see if we can respond as as well um, so but just before I finish sharing the screen, just so everyone can see me. Hello, my name is Dr. Nick Fair. Uh, I'm a senior research engineer from the University of Southampton. I work in a group there called IT Innovation. Uh, and we are interested in um, developing uh, things that actually go out into the real world. So we're not so focused on the conceptual and theoretical. Uh, we're, we're interested in the applied and the practical, uh, which is why uh, for example, I was referring to open educational resources. And just to return to that question from Matilda, I've been able to develop, for example, entire six, eight week long online courses with edited videos, with interaction, um, with quizzes, with all these uh, other types of sort of good practice in um, digital education using only free and open source software. So you can you can get a WordPress page, you can get a free learning management system plugin, you can use all sorts of free services like H5P uh, to add interactivity. You can edit videos using free editing software, and I'm sure this is something that Tell in his bit will come on to talk about and and maybe show some of these actual practical open tools. It's also why 
Tell and myself and others are very committed to open educational resources uh, and to supporting the, the 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 free sharing of materials. That doesn't mean, however, that the hardware, such as the mobile phone, the laptop, or whatever else, <coughs> excuse me, uh, is free and accessible to everybody. But at least we can try and make some of the resources free uh, and keep keep it as a, a as an option for everybody and not just those that can afford to use the, the technologies this is a particular concern for me in the area of virtual reality where vr has got a lot of strong educational benefits but developing the vr environments and developing the vr um, models is all in the hands of uh, private companies at the moment uh, and that's an area that we as educators need to keep a close eye on Okay, let me now share my screen. Today, I'm going to talk to you uh, about uh, network learning. And really the theme or the background to this is, uh, uh, so Mohammed's just actually asked if we can share some uh, links to the courses in the mix. Yes, well, we will do. Uh, Mac has just talked about one that we've developed in this project. Uh, and I'll introduce you to another one at the end of my section um, where you can, but there's, there's big MOOC providers such as Future Learn um uh, uh that you can um study at for free or for a very limited cost uh, okay so network learning is where we'll start off today uh, and we will first of all have a look at what it actually means to learn in the digital age so how 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 do we learn things and what are those learning theories now some of you may be familiar with some of these theories especially some of the earlier ones um but we'll think about what it means to learn before the we had the digital age and what that means to learn now that we're in the digital age. Then we'll look at some of the learning theories that are suited for the digital age. And then we'll look more, we'll move slightly out of learning theory and a bit more into pedagogy. So in other words, the practice of teaching when we look at network learning and finally looking at personal learning networks. That's my particular area of specialism uh, in personal learning networks. Well, I've been mapping them for some years now. Okay, so, before the digital age, what did it mean to learn? So there's quite a number of these learning theories that we study when we do our uh, training uh, and education courses um, are, were developed a, a long time ago, uh, some sort of 60, 80, 100 years ago, even some of them. Uh, and those perhaps haven't got such relevance anymore now that the digital world, and by digital here, I mean uh, web-enabled technologies, so basically a combination of the internet and the devices you use to access it, uh, and all of the services on the internet. So first of all, we had the learning theory of behavioralism. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. This is basically the idea of a trained response. Uh, it, we probably learnt to do our sums in our mathematics uh, using this. If I ask you what is two times two, you immediately know the answer four you're not thinking about it, you're not doing the sum, you've just learned it as a trained response, two times two is four. And so that's the idea of behavioralism. Uh, and it suggests that it's, we, we are essentially similar to animals and can be trained to give the right answers uh, with enough repetition and enough reward or and or punishment. Uh, then we move from behavioralism uh, and the name there is uh, Skinner is the, is the name most famously associated with these theories. And any of the names you see in brackets throughout this are the names of the people who are most associated with these theories. We then moved away from behavioralism and into something called cognitivism. And this was Chomsky's kind of idea and many others. And here this suggests that learning is something that happens inside the brain. That basically the brain has a map of the world, a map of knowledge. And when we do something, it causes that map or what's called a mental schema to change to incorporate the new things that we've done the new experiences the new information that we have and we draw a new mental map and that new mental map is uh, a, an advanced a more advanced version of the old one and so therefore that is what learning is but both of these theories are as i say now old uh, and were both developed long before the digital age. And this links back to sort of Macca's picture of the of the books being fed into the machine and then it being transmitted into your brain um, electronically. It's sort of these two theories kind of reflect that thinking 
the, the first that you can train humans like animals and the second that you can implant knowledge into their brains and change their mental schemas but of course these theories have moved on a bit since then so in this part of the talk i'm going to ask you to be a little bit more interactive in a moment i'm going to ask you to open up an app and give you a chance to vote and do some polling but before we do that just have a quick look at this picture and see if for you do you see anything wrong with this picture when it comes to teaching and learning i'm sure it's a picture we all recognize we've all been in lectures or given them um so just have a little think about that is there anything that you see wrong with this way of teaching and learning and while you ever think about that could you please uh if you've got access to the web don't worry if you haven't um, you, you'll see the results um uh, connected together um but if you can go to vivox uh and then you can either use the app or the or the website it doesn't matter but as soon as you get to the web page it'll ask you for an id number if you can input that id number you'll get through to the polls and that way we can all interact together and you can vote on some of the questions i'm about to ask perhaps if you can give me a little um just a yes or a thumbs up or something in the chat so i know that you're having some luck getting through if you can't if you're not able to do it it's fine okay good so if everybody's in or most people are in let's go to the first of our questions so looking at this picture again and thinking about this how active are the learners in this and if I can, you'll have 20 seconds for you all to complete your votes. The poll's open currently. How active are the learners? Okay. So that should give us our responses. Okay, interesting. So clearly the, the majority of you, just the majority of you would say that this is passive. Um, some people see this as semi-active. I would like to know, uh, for those who voted semi-active, why you think, uh, why you think it, this qualifies as semi-active. Um, if you think about it, the students are just sitting there in the chair, looking at a person at the front, who's using some kind of a screen. But as Marina says in the um, chat, she asks, in, in what way is this different from a medieval approach? I mean, okay, it's a lecture and a smart board, but it's the same basic idea. So some interesting ideas or interesting responses there. Um, for me, I think it is quite a passive uh, way of learning. You're, you're supposed to sit quietly and listen. And I've given the passive as the right answer there. Okay, next question. What interaction is occurring? So let's think about interaction now. So what, what's actually happening in this context? Okay, let's see the responses. We've got up to nine, that's good. And it should be closing any second. Let's see, oh, we've got a tenth. I guess there's some time difference delays. Okay, so let's see what the results are here. Yeah, okay, that's much clearer. Yeah, teacher talking. Uh, one of the things I got taught very early on in my teacher training was that teacher talking time should be kept to a minimum. Um, yeah, I, was, I wasn't sure myself whether to say that there's no interaction here uh, either. And obviously teacher student to an extent, but for me, teacher student would be more about the teachers interacting with the students. So the students might be in groups, they might be uh, 
being asked questions and things like that. Uh, this particular picture, the, it looks to me that the teacher is just standing at the front rather than uh, interacting. Uh, and no interaction, well, I think, again, it's not no interaction because there is something happening. There is a teacher talking, but it's very unclear to me whether you would actually count that as interaction. So you could you could make an argument that there's no interaction happening here. Okay, next question. What digital technologies are being used by students? Okay, we should be finishing soon. Just waiting for the final response. And I think the answer is, again, fairly clear here. Okay, good. Yes, exactly. I mean, it, it, if everyone's sort of doing as they're supposed to be doing, then there's no technologies being used at all. I mean, they might be taking notes on a pen or paper, possibly. Um, but yeah, and they might well be hiding in the back row, looking at their mobile phones, or have their laptops open, pretending that they're making notes, but actually watching YouTube videos. Um, so we, we don't know, but that's any of you who've taught in a lecture theatre um, will know that, you know, probably at least half the people in there are not actually paying any attention to the lecture at all. Um, they're using their technologies. So teaching where there's no technology involved becomes problematic. And finally, a quick question. Where else in life would you ever be in a situation like that? all sitting in rows, all facing the front, all being silent. Okay, so we should be close to having the responses. Here we go. And obviously, the only place we would ever really be in a context anything like this would be at a theatre or a cinema where we are supposed to sit facing the front silently uh, and absorb what is happening on the stage or the screen in front of us. But it's not uh, exactly a, 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 a modern interactive learning experience great so thank you very much for taking part in the poll so we've looked at we've looked at essentially behavioralism cognitivism those two are represented if you like by that picture that you're sitting there being trained to give responses or absorbing information to change your your mental schema but actually these are not the most relevant to the digital age so after the digital age, and essentially by that we mean after the web and particularly after the um, smartphones and, and um, ubiquitous access to the web, uh, some of these th learning theories or other theories uh, have come to be more relevant uh, and to take a, a more central position. So if we look at social constructivism, uh, this one's uh, actually from the 1970s, this theory, so it does predate the internet. Um, but it's uh, it still has lots of relevance for how things happen online. And if you look at this particular picture, you can see there's quite a difference here between that and the one we were looking at before. 
So yeah, I'm sure you can notice those differences. We have got the idea of things happening inside the brain, but in this case, it's a very different kind of context, isn't it? So social constructivism suggests that through um, a shared understanding that we have, and that that's shared understanding comes from a shared language, shared cultures, shared reference points, shared experiences, uh, that we can transmit knowledge between each other uh, and from one person to another and another person to the one in a way that there is social interaction and that knowledge is constructed or built by socially agreeing um, on what something means or how something should be understood. Uh, and so in this case, learning best occurs when it's through interactions with other people. So sitting silently in a row in a lecture theatre, listening to uh, somebody at the front, there is no interaction there. There is no socially constructed knowledge. There is knowledge from one person being given to another person. But this knowledge is not being discussed, debated, developed, um, and, and uh, therefore absorbed and understood uh, in the way that um, social constructivism suggests is much more effective. So what this really means is that in theory, learning requires us to be actively interacting with other people. This passive lecture theatre uh, model doesn't work. And obviously when we went on to COVID uh, lockdowns and teachers had to in the remote um, emergency remote teaching period, just had to try and do something online. Many teachers were trying to copy what they did offline online. So they were having huge 30, 40, 100, 200 people in a Zoom call or, or, or a, 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 a webinar like this and just talking as we are now. This is one of the reasons why I've tried to be a bit more interactive in this particular uh, speech to try and bring in some interactivity and to show you how that can be done in an online setting. So interaction is important. Uh, and what this means in practice is the idea of peer learning. So students working together in a collaborative way to resolve tasks uh, and they can do this either together in in person i.e sitting next to each other in a room or they can do this uh, through technologies through both being online but being in their separate bedrooms using something like zoom to to talk together sharing documents and resources such as google docs where they can both work on the same document um, so collaborative peer learning doesn't mean only face to face it's also using the digital technologies to create these collaborative spaces where you've got a group of three four five of you occupying the same digital space even if you're in different physical locations okay the next of the theories is socio-technical theory uh, and this one actually doesn't come from education this comes from something called science and technology studies uh, and Mac mentioned socio-technical relationships. And what this really means is that societies and technologies are completely tied up together. You can't separate one from the other one because the development of a society depends completely on the technologies that, the, that society has. So taking a very simple example, before people used to travel around on foot or maybe on a horse, uh, and then they invented the wheel and all of a sudden you could travel in a cart and then a cart became a carriage and a carriage became a car and a car became so on and so on. So each time that, 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 that this technology came along, it changed the way people did things. It changed society. Suddenly you could walk way, where it would take you one day to walk 10 miles. Now with a car, you can travel 10 miles in two minutes. So it changes the whole way that society develops. Uh, technologies change the whole way societies develop. But at the same time, it works the other way around as well, that uh, societies demand things from their technologies. So for example, people were very happy to have a telephone on a wall in their house uh, or uh, for a while. And then after a while, because telephones were useful and a good way to communicate, people wanted the telephone in their pocket. They wanted to be able to communicate all the time. So we developed from a normal home phone into a mobile phone and then from there into a smartphone. And so the development of technology 
is dependent on what society wants to do with technology and the development of society is dependent on the technologies the society have available to them so in other words the theory here is that people societies and technologies cannot be separated therefore learning cannot be separated from the technologies used for learning so in this case the picture we saw at the beginning where they're not using any technologies or maybe a, a sneaking a look at their mobile phone underneath this you know behind the seats or behind the back of the person in front this is this shows you that students can't be separated from their technologies uh, and so therefore as educators we have to be able to incorporate these technologies into the learning process in all ways, in positive, useful ways. Okay, now the next theory uh, underpinning this is connectivism. Again, this comes from uh, education, the field of education. Uh, and this is the idea that um, uh, it's a very modern learning theory and there is still some debate as to whether this should even be counted as a learning theory or not. Uh, however, I think generally the course of travel is that people are accepting that this is a learning theory. Uh, and this is a learning theory developed since the digital age. It was actually sort of the early 2000s. And for me, is therefore uh, the most relevant to how we actually teach and learn today. And this is the idea that knowledge and skills and learning emerge from making connections. And the important thing is it's connections in all sorts of different connections. It's a big network of connections. So it's connections with other people. It's connections with other experiences that you've had. It's connections with um, uh, the wider world and diverse other people. And this is really important because by, by making these connections to information, to people, to, uh, to experiences in all sorts of different contexts, we humans generally are good at identifying patterns and we will find patterns in these connections patterns between different parts different bits of information patterns between what different people tell us patterns between uh the the uh information online uh that we can then use to develop our knowledge and to improve our learning so key here is that learning is about making connections lots and lots and lots of different connections a big network of connections and then identifying the patterns between all the distributed information and all the diverse people and all the other amazing things that can be part of that network so in practice what this means is that to learn in the digital age we require a, an active and useful network that we need to be able to develop these networks and teaching and learning becomes or teaching becomes a process of helping our students to develop these networks, to develop these connections, to be able to identify meaningful patterns. Uh, it doesn't become standing at the front and lecturing. It becomes helping students to connect with the right people, the right information, uh, and, and, um, and, and then they apply their own, their own knowledge and uh, views. Okay. So in essence, the idea of connectivism is that there's you and you use resources, which can be digital and non-digital, uh, to make connections with people and with technologies. So remember, the connections are not just people to people. And keep in mind, there's a question here that uh, I think somebody mentioned. Yes, I think it's Matilda is mentioned. Yes, these, these ideas of connectivism and, and networks are both digital and non-digital at the same time. We can have a face-to-face -face connection or we could have an online connection or I could connect with a book or I could connect with a, a website. There's no, there's no real distinction about this except that the technologies allow for much wider, much more diverse and much more complex networks than if we do it face-to-face. -face. So we, make, we use our resources to make connections with people and with technologies and information and then we discover all this diverse information that's online and offline. And from that, we identify patterns and relationships amongst all this information. And through that process, we gain new learning and new knowledge. Um, so. Uh, one second. Let's get that 
mouse back in the right place. So in summary, for learning in the digital age, I think it helps for us to think that it is social. In other words, it needs other people and it's based around interaction. Uh, the learning is inseparable from the technologies that we use for learning. Uh, bear in mind, the technology here can still be a book. You know, that's still a form of technology. It's certainly printed by technological uh, items. And that learning involves using technologies to make networks of connections with diverse people and distributed information. So in other words, learning is networked. And that brings us to the idea of network learning. So this here now is, is, is more pedagogy than a theory. We've looked at the underpinning theories. We're now moving on to the pedagogy. How do we actually do things? So network learning is, is, a, is an idea that as the teacher, what we do is create a situation where learning, um, where we use technology uh, for learning purposes to create these networks of connections. That can be between learners, so the peer learning concept from social constructivism. It can between be between learners, teachers, and a lot of other people. So that can be more of the, 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 the network's idea of connectivism. Uh, and also, of course, we connect with information. Uh, and then we can connect with whole different communities and we can link to all the learning resources. I mean, this is a very good example of that, where we've got people from all sorts of different learning communities from different parts of the world, from Ghana, from India, from Italy, from Turkey, from all over the world. Uh, and we are now sharing or connecting our communities and we're now sharing our learning resources because we're pointing you towards the MOOCs. We're, we're helping you um, with that and you're giving us connections and links back in the chat. So you're sharing ideas with us and we're all learning from each other. So this is the idea of, of as teachers, we try to facilitate our students growing these types of networks. So. Uh, why are we stuck on this slide? So some of the features of network learning is that what it does is, and this is the important bit about the technology part of it, is that it expands our concepts of place and time. Before learning was something you did in the classroom at a set timetable with a teacher at the front talking to you. Now, place can be anywhere. Time can be any time. Uh, and so you can basically um, learn in all settings and at any time. We've expanded our concept of the classroom. Network learning involves interacting with diverse people with different, lots of different information sources and also lots of services like ChatGPT and all sorts of other ones that can help us to make sense of and do things with that information. Network learning can be used in formal, semi-formal and informal learning. So formal is in the classroom, semi-formal is where you're studying, but uh, consciously studying, uh, but not in a fixed location. And informal is where you're just doing normal fun what you might think of as fun things, but your learning is happening as a part of it. Uh, we, the, an important part of network learning is that the technologies are used to create these networks, grow, build them, then to nurture them and grow them, uh, and then to use them when we need to do some kind of learning task. So us, our role as teachers is to facilitate the, the creation of these networks, the growth and nurturing of these networks, and then the use of these networks. Um, so Matilda asks, how do we facilitate this? So for example, you set a, a task where um, rather than just sort of asking a question, you might set a problem. You might provide a list of starter sources. And uh, for example, it might be a Twitter account of a famous thinker. It might be a YouTube account. For example, um, Downs, Stephen Downs, who developed the connectivism theory, runs a very active YouTube channel. So as the teacher, you can say, Go to these different places, find this information, think about it, and come back to me with an answer to this problem. And that answer could be in the form of a video, it could be a blog, it could be an infographic. It, it doesn't just have to be a written essay or, 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 or an answer to a set of maths problems or a piece of code. Um, so that's just a very quick example, so I hope that's a, a, a slightly helpful. Uh, and of course, a uh, it helps us to think about interactions in a network learning context as there being a medium. So it's a digital device or face to face. So as the teacher, when we're facilitating, we think, right, what medium should we use um, 
then there's a purpose for the interaction. So what are we actually uh, using the network for? What is the task we're trying to achieve? And then there's an endpoint of an interaction. That endpoint might be human or non-human. So somebody might connect with me uh, via uh, a um, text message, for example, for the purpose of finding out what time uh, the class starts. Or the endpoint might be non-human. Somebody might go to a web page, or might go to somebody's blog, or it might be asynchronous contact with the human, something Maka was mentioning within her wider domain. So in practice, what this means uh, is that if you think of yourself as you here, you might use a smartphone, which is a device, to ask a friend on Facebook, which is a connection, for a useful web link for your essay, and that's information. Or you might use a laptop to access a, a, an academic journal to find data or findings. But the basic process is the same. You have a resource, a technology, that you use to make a connection for a reason from which you get some information that you then use and so if you think about these network, personal learner networks as us at the center with all these different paths radiating out from us to all these different endpoints for all these different purposes, then we start to see that the network can look something like uh, this. So a personal learner network is basically the, the, the sum total of all these connections that we make with different people, different devices, different technologies, different tools and services, different information, uh, and that we use all of these in our day-to-day -day learning activities. We do it all the time ourselves. We look something up on Google. We ask a friend what the answer is. We uh, we, we send an email. Uh, we read a book. So the key takeaway here is that as teachers assisting learners to build, maintain, and actively use, or if you like, create, nurture, and use, uh, a personal learning network is the most effective way to... Uh, deliver network learning in the digital age. And if you're interested in learning more about this, then we have actually online a, a, an open free tool. You can follow this link here to iSurvey. There's a survey there that'll take about 10 minutes to complete. At the end of that survey, you'll get a link uh, and a personal login number. If you follow that link and then log in with your number, you'll be able to map your learning network for yourself. So this one here, you can see that you've got the people in the middle, you've got devices in the first circle, you've got the reasons or purposes for the interactions in the second circle, and then in the small end circles, you've got all the endpoints. So you could follow from the person, uses their mobile phone for searching and browsing the web and for doing web searches. And the thicker the line connecting each of these nodes, the more frequently you use this method. And this map you can see right here is the network, is the personal learning network map for around about a thousand different people all over the world. And you can see that mostly people use their mobile phone more than anything else. You can see this line is much thicker than say here for desktop or here for tablet. And they use it most for searching and browsing. And they use that most, the thickest line here is for searching the web. So you can see from this, first of all, you can see what your own network map looks like, which will be a lot smaller than this because it will be just for one person. And then you can compare your map with this map, uh, which is for everyone who's done it. And you can filter this map so that it can show the, the, the total map for people who are just like you. So female, age 30, ethnicity, country residence, and so on. So you can compare your learning network with lots of other people. And all of this uh, is also contained, or there's more information about a lot of this. Oops. Uh, there's a lot of information about all of this in this MOOC here called Learning in the Network Age, uh, which is a MOOC on FutureLearn. FutureLearn is a big MOOC platform. Uh, and you can find out more about all of these ideas uh, by looking there, So, which is also free. Uh, and um, highly recommended. 
okay i'm gonna have to stop there um so i uh in summary for us as teachers need to stop thinking about learning as the lecture theater and the expert and instead starts to think of it as something that's not contained within a classroom that's not requiring an expert to give information but instead requires us as teachers to facilitate the building of these useful uh, and 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 diverse networks using all the different tools all the different technologies all the different uh, online and offline uh, resources that we have available to create the best environment for our students to learn in the most uh, suitable way for the digital age so i hope that was uh, very useful uh, and yes matilda says yes exactly it's it's basically especially with chat, chat gpt changing things as well then the actual act of, of of mechanically producing things is going to be much less important than the the role of developing thinking developing this idea of making connections valuing diversity finding patterns learning Th those are the, those are the those are the things that uh, a network learning approach can really help to facilitate okay i'm gonna to have to stop now unfortunately i'm also going to have to say goodbye to everybody because I'm, I'm actually running a little bit late for another meeting that i unfortunately can't avoid so just a big thank you to everyone who's been here uh and who's who's um actually taking part thanks for all the questions during the um presentation that was really nice to see that you're engaged um and i'll now hand you over to tell amiel who's going to talk to you about open educational resources uh, and this follows on very nicely from the conversation we've been having around what's open and what's owned by companies. Um, and so thank you, Maka. Thank you, Tel. And uh, have a very good afternoon, everybody, uh, if it's afternoon where you are, or a good morning if not. Bye. Right. Well, thank you, uh, Nick. Thank you, Maka. Thank you, everyone, for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. I uh, will try to go uh, directly to the presentation, I think, because we have, uh, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure how much time we have left, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to go fairly quickly through, through some of the material that I wanted to present. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, Tel Emil, I'm from Brazil, I'm a, a UNESCO Chair in Distance Education, and I am currently here in Slovenia in the Josef Stefan Institute, uh, uh, working on, on the issues that I'm going to some of the issues that I'm going to present to you today. And I'm going to actually take, um, I think it's a, it's a very nice connection between what, uh, what's been said so far and also um, some of the things that I, I see in the chat uh, uh, in regards to, to some of the issues that come up when we discuss uh, educational technology implementation uh, and also particularly the, the issues of network learning. And, and I come to, from this from the perspective of, of open education. And before getting into specifically discussing open authoring tools, uh, I, I want to kind of do the, the setting or the context for this discussion today. And, and uh, one of the comments in the chat really uh, addressed this, the same issues. What, what environment are we in today and, and what are the, the tools that we're using? How do, we, how do we think about them in the context that we're, we're living in, in, in today? So if, if you're unfamiliar with, with the concept of, of open education in a very small nugget, open education is interesting to removing barriers to, to education access, uh, completion, success uh, in all possible forms. So open education is interested in formal education in, in informal settings and non-formal settings. And it's particularly um, catalyzed, say, by the tools today, digital tools and uh, new forms of, of, of communication that are available to us today. So even though open education is not a new phenomenon, it has taken a very interesting turn because of the things that I think uh, both Mark and Nick have talked about. We have, when we have new tools, we change the way we communicate, we change the way we think, we change the way we live, and there's no way this is not gonna impact in a sense of how we do education. And, and open education is, is, is trying to leverage uh, whatever is, is, is available to us to, to think about how we remove barriers to education. The way we conceptualize it today, uh, it, it, in, in, at least in, in, uh, in my group, is, is we're focused on, on four basic pillars. One, which is, I think, the most visible and most common that people are very much aware of, is, is called open educational resources. 
and I won't I won't be able to get into too much detail about OER today, but but it, it deals with content. It's this idea of how do you make content openly available to people. And the idea of an open content is very different from a free content. So open and free uh, generally are very different terms. Open uh, has some specificities. In the case of open educational resources, uh, you generally are talking about making use of open licenses, uh, things that allow legally uh, for people to make use, remix, reuse, revise, repurpose, change, modify, um, and, and share resources. So uh, we, we take this world of the of, of the web and we think about how can people more more openly share what they create and reuse what they find. And so open licenses do that from a legal perspective. And then the second aspect is this idea of open formats, which is making use of standard formats, internationally agree upon standards when you save your files, when you share your files, so that people can actually technically open, uh, use, see, and also modify uh, these, these, these files. And this is, a, this is really a, a huge movement. Uh, UNESCO has a, a recommendation on this from 2019. It's an important you know, recommendation. They really, uh, they really try to think about how, how um, as educators, as students, uh, uh, how do we share our resources? How do we make use of other people's resources? How do we make it so that it's easier to do this? That's in a nugget, what, in a nutshell, what, what OERs uh, are. And, and MOOCs sometimes are open, sometimes they're not. A lot of times MOOCs are free. Uh, a lot of times MOOCs are open. And, uh, and it's, it's important to know the distinction. So this is the first pillar. OER is, is I think, the most, um, the most essential, uh, invisible part of the movement of open education uh, in, in this, this decade, in the past couple of decades. The second pillar is one I'm going to talk a little bit more about today, which is the, the, the pillar of free and open source software, right? So uh, if we talk about resources as being open as, as one pillar, the other one is, is open software, or sort of free and open software, which is this idea that you have software that gives you similar permissions. It gives you permission to see the code. You can see how it works. You can modify it. You can make changes to it. And you can share it back to the community. And of course, the free and open source movement uh, is older uh, in the sense in the, dis in the discussion of open educational resources, but they share a lot of similarities, right? Software is not educational content. They're very different, but some of the principles or most of the principles are really quite, quite similar. How can we share software that's transparent, visible, auditable, people can see, modify, change, and be part of this community in the very similar sense to what, what Nick was mentioning in terms of being part of this network community we live in today. The third one, which is often not discussed in open education movement, which is uh, important for us, is this idea of digital rights, which I'll get to uh, in just a little bit, which is uh, because of where we are today, uh, the, the use of, of, of technology and, and, um, and systems, educational systems that use technology is, is not a choice. So in a very real sense, I think what, what Maka was mentioning earlier in, in the sense of, of the entanglement of education and technology, uh, if you look at the COVID period, uh, it was it made things very clear for everybody that um, education and technology are, are not uh, something that you can dissociate. So even though we might often say things like uh, uh, you, you can learn without technology, I think during the COVID period, that was very much not the case for most people. And I'll give you a very simple example that has repeated itself all over the world is that when um, school systems were, uh, were entering the COVID period, they moved their systems to, to educational platforms. And so if a kid, you know, an eight, uh, 10 year old kid wanted to go to school, he didn't or she didn't have a choice to actually walk to a school. She had to be mediated by a platform to get access to education. So the very basic human right to education, the very basic human right to culture, was uh, entangled with uh, a choice of, uh, of a platform. And this choice was generally not a choice that was done by the end user, the student, the teacher. It was something that was decided by somebody. And all you, all you had access to was a specific platform to access education. And that brings up really big issues of, of digital rights. I mean, who, who, what platforms are you using? Who made those decisions? What data is being collected? Uh, what, what rights do you have in these platforms? What choices do you have? This is a really big movement. If you move your stuff online, if you become a networked learner, digital rights are an essential component of your, of your concerns. And then the fourth one is this idea of open educational practices, right? So the only reason we do all this as educators to think about open educational resources, that we think about free and open source software, digital rights, is because we want to be more open educators, right? We want our practice or our 
pedagogical practice to be more open. And, um, and that's a, a, a also another discussion, but it entangles with these four items. If you, if you make use of more open education resources and you practice this as part of your teaching, if you're interested in the open source and free and open source movement, if you're attuned to digital rights, if you are in this, in this space, you're moving towards becoming a more network connected, less hierarchical educator, which are some of the things that have been discussed previously as well. So this is the, this is the environment that we're, that we're in and, and how open authoring tools come into this. Now, one of the questions from the, the chat, which was, was really important to, to, to help us think about this context of, uh, that we're living today in, in this, say, new normal, is this uh, idea of, of um, platforms, right, and how they've been, uh, they've been mediating our, our communication in our lives. And so we, we have what is called a, a, a uh, uh, observatory on, on what we call surveillance cap capitalism. But I'm going to just show you very quickly one piece of data, which I think is very relevant for our discussion, um, to, 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 to talk about why we need open authoring tools, open systems, and things like this. So uh, we keep an, uh, an up-to-date uh, observatory of the relationship between uh, higher education institutions and, and big corporations in technology, right? The kinds of corporations like you know, Microsoft and Google and that offer platforms for education that really grew during the COVID pandemic. And if you look at the case of, of, of South America, where we've mapped every single higher education institution, public education institution, you're going to see that nearly 80% of all institu institutions are, are, uh, have their educational systems mediated by only two very large corporations. Uh, this, is, this repeats itself uh, in poor countries all over the world. It's a little, little bit different in different countries in Europe, in the U.S., for example. But with this is really... Uh, this is really uh, uh, up-to-date data for, from South America. Why is this all relevant to what we're discussing? As, as one person in the chat put earlier, um, these, these uh, platforms, this mediation becomes uh, a de facto tool that you have to use to, to participate in educational processes, right? I'm very sorry, Tal. I know that you don't see the chat, but there are some very nice discussions going on on the side. I would yes. like you to also be aware of these. Our uh, Matilda here is asking very provocative and very thought-provoking questions that are really important. So mm -hmm. she said, what about MOOCs? Like, uh, this is a very good case, and it's connected to the actual topic of discussion you're saying. Like, MOOCs started as an open resources, but then it, they became business, and now we have this platform uh, sort of ecosystem, and you also mentioned surveillance capitalism, and I gave reference to the participants uh, by Zuboff. Yes. So this is something that I want you to know that we are discussing. We have side discussions here, which Excellent. is becoming very interesting. Yeah. I'm just Excellent. stopping. Yeah, that's, that's very good. Um, yeah, these are all these are all uh, connected. Uh, in, in, I hope that you start making these connections. If you haven't, like Maka is helping you do there, is, is making these connections. Um, uh, MOOCs are a very similar phenomenon, in this difference between open and free. And I'll, I'll get back to that in just, in just a second as well. Um, but if you look at what, happen, what, what happens in the scenario today, and, and maybe if you know information from your country, it would be really interesting to, or your own institution, it would be interesting to see that in the chat as well. Um, this move towards these, these platforms, this is a whole separate discussion but for us here today what what connecting to what's been discussed so far is this idea that you cannot discuss today you can't really be an educator today and say i'm an educator uh technology is another issue i i, I don't deal with this i don't deal with technology right? or, or i'll just use whatever is given to me you don't have that option anymore if, if in the past you said well maybe i'll use uh, the the digital uh, board to write today or i'm going to use the video conferencing system and i'm going to try something new most times today as an educator, you don't have that luxury. Whether you like it or not, your relationship with students is mediated by some or a collection of platforms that you do not decide, uh, what the, and you don't decide what those platforms are, what the functionalities are, what they offer. You are mostly in a position to be a user of these platforms, or you can deviate and use something else. But these are de facto parts of educational governance, right? They're there. And this creates for us, as, uh, as, and maybe some of you that identify as, as more open educators or let's say network educators, this creates a really big problem because uh, now these, these, these choices have been made and this is something that you have no control over. 
Now, the consequences of this are, are really interesting because um, it, it, it leads you to think about if you want to be more of an open educator, you want to be a more connected educator, uh, some of these tools are not particularly appropriate, particularly with this discussion that I mentioned earlier in terms of, of uh, assuring that people have digital rights, assuring that you have control of the resources that you use, assuring that the software that you're using is is something that is not collecting data from your students that you don't want to collect, that your students understand how the software works. So all of these other issues that we're trying to do in terms of our open educational practice become very much hampered by this, this notion of these massive platforms that have taken over education. So this is a concern. One of the ways, and now getting to the more, say, lighter side of the conversation, this is, this is the setting that we're in, all right, in this entanglement between education and technology and this very strong pressure from these very large corporations in education, which now connecting to the idea of MOOCs is, is I think, very similar. When the MOOCs started, they were kind of a NIMBY enterprise. You know, it was, a, it, was, it was just a bunch of people trying to see how we could use the benefit of, of network learning to create uh, powerful, uh, uh, you know, sometimes massive groups of people learning together in very independent fashion. So it challenges a, a bit of the way we do evaluation, it challenges the way we think about resources. And it was a very open enterprise in the sense of, of connecting people very openly with each other. And it's in, you know, surely in very little time, it became a corporate enterprise. Right? MOOCs have become corporatized and now a lot of the courses that you get for free, they're free up to a certain point. Uh, they're free, but if you want the certificate, you get you have to pay. Uh, they're they're free, but they collect your data and they use it for other purposes. And then there are still very many MOOCs that are very clear in their policy of of being open. Uh, the resources are open. Registration is kept to a minimum in terms of the amount of data they collect. They don't sell your data, and they might offer you a certificate for money, but it's very transparent that that's what they're doing. It's just you go through the course, you pay, you get a certificate, and that's it. So these are very different modes of operating, but they're part, I think, of the very much of the same phenomenon, which is this. This, this, uh, this relationship of, of educational technology that's been privatized uh, in, a, in, in a very nuanced sense by these, these very large corporations that have taken over, over education. So if you are worried about these kinds of things and you're an educator, um, you might just throw your hands up in the air and say, the world is horrible, I quit, I can't do this anymore, this is, this is too much. And that's not what we want to do, right? We don't. We don't want to get into, into this mode of, of desperation, even though times are, are quite difficult if you're an educational technologist or if you're interested in educational technology. This is, this is a very tense time for us to be alive because of these, this scenario that we're in, but it's also a time of, of really great opportunity. Now, one of the ways we think is interesting for us to, to engage with this environment, to try to find ways to engage with this environment, and, and there are many ways to do this, is, is to, to work with... Um, promoting these types of open tools and open source and uh, OER and all of these kinds of things. This is a site that I was hoping to have uh, done translation by, by today, but it, it wasn't possible. But in, in the next uh, uh, probably month or so, we'll have uh, a multilingual version of this site. But I just wanted to point to, to you that this is a project that we've been engaged for a while, which is this, uh, this idea of showing what open source free and open source and open tools are available for people to, to do this kind of open practice or network learning. Um, and, and I'm gonna try to share some of these tools with you today and some of these ideas. Now, I'll put the link to all of this in, in the chat in just a bit, but to get you engaged also, and to actually show you a tool that you might not know, let me put in the chat this link. This is, um, this is the first example and also the, the, the place where we might end up cooperating a little bit in the next you know 10 or 15 minutes which is uh, an etherpad and and an etherpad is is a, a free and open source tool that allows people to massively collaborate in creating documents now, this is just the first example of many i'm going to show you can see i have a lot of, of tabs open over there to kind of give you a sense of of a different classes of, of open free and open source tools that that we use that other people use that are very much aligned with this principle of you have a, a, you work collaboratively with students, you work in a more horizontal fashion, you use, of course, free and open source tools that are particularly concerned with this idea of, of access, of privacy, of open formats, of, of open content that allow you to create open content. And if incorporating these tools in your practice kind of gets you in the direction of, of promoting these, these principles that I mentioned earlier, right? So by incorporating uh, uh, open authoring tools into your practice, you 
make it easier for you to create open educational resources because you can use open formats. Uh, you, if you use platforms that are based on free and open source software, you generally, these platforms are generally much more concerned with this idea of digital rights. So some of them won't ask you for any registration. Most of them won't ask you to give you any personal information. Um, importantly, they're free and open source. So you can see the code. You have a part of a, you have a, a large community of people that are reviewing the code, auditing the code, making sure it's, it's legitimate. It's not collecting data that's not supposed to. It's not doing things it's not supposed to do beyond the functionality of the software. And with this, uh, with this one, one type of engagement, you can get into, uh, into becoming a little bit more of an open educational practitioner, right? So in this, um, in this big list that we have, this is something that I've collected every time I do this particular talk uh, over the past four or five years. And this list has been created not by me, but uh, by the people that participate in this talk. So you are more than welcome to join this link and add your own suggestion. If you have a, a free and open source software tool for education, you're more than welcome to add that to our list and it will be useful to other people as well but it's become a really great resource for people to to find what i'm gonna what i'm gonna use right now is just kind of show you some for some of you these might be well known um and you're welcome to get a cup of coffee and come back but uh some of you uh, might not know these and generally i find that a lot of people are, are not aware and these are some of the, my favorite tools that i consistently use with with students over the last decade they're stable, they're useful, they've been around for a very long time, uh, and I think they're really, really valuable for, for becoming more, more of an open educator. And so I'll keep this pad open for your suggestions, uh, and you're welcome to use this now or later, but let me go through a very quick list. Uh, so the, the first tool, of course, is this is Etherpad. And if you haven't gone into the link, I, I can see there are some people here. I'll add my name here on the top. Uh, this is a place for you to do massive collaboration. So you can you can have hundreds of people here typing, and you can see I'm typing here, um, and somebody else could type. They'll, you'll see them typing as well in a different color. Uh, Etherpads are fantastic for for things like this when you're in a conference or you know in a group and you want students to do some brainstorming in different groups. They're very very easy to create. They're available in many sites. You can go to say Rise Up, which has a pad. Um, in France, they have the, this other system, which is called France uh, Université Numérique. Uh, it's called, let me open the, the link here. It's called Pad Education. There are a bunch of installations that you can use for, for Etherpads. And you can just go and you can create um, very easily here a new pad. And let's say I'm going to create the Bridges Lecture Pad. And... Immediately, it will create a space here for me. The link is very easy to follow. It's right up there. And I can start padding. And I often use this with students in, in, um, in very large groups or in small groups. So I'll have students do summaries together. Or I'll, if they're working in groups, I'll have them have pads, write things down, and come back. It's great because you can get a track of who's writing what. So you can see if people are participating. Uh, so if somebody starts typing here, I'll be able to see. Uh, and it keeps track of this as well. So you can see if students, if over time, if students were participating or if they weren't participating. Let me see if I can show you that real quick, which is kind of nice. So if you look at, at the pad over time, let's go a little bit earlier. You can see that it keeps versions of this and you can see that people have been changing it. Um, and this becomes like a track of, of who has been doing what. So Lucy here is adding a bunch of stuff. There are a bunch of other people adding things now. You can see this movement over time. And pads can be really exciting to keep track of things uh, that are happening in class. And they become a kind of an ephemeral resource. You know, they can, they can go away, but they become a really great place for collaboration. So this is, this is one place for more ephemeral things. If you want to do something more consistent, I think all of you, of course, have an experience using Wikipedia for consulting documents and finding information. But generally when I ask people if they've edited Wikipedia, that number goes down drastically. Most people never edit Wikipedia. And the reason we don't do this is because it is kind of an authoritative source. You don't wanna just go there and mess it up. But a good place that a lot of people don't know about is, is Wikiversity and Wikiversity is, is a, it's kind of a, a place where you can go to create a, a research group. You can create a, a uh, uh, a study group, and you can have your own space in any one of the languages in Wikipedia, and you can create your own space 
to work with your students, work with a class, work with a research group, and create content together. So I have this, which is called Educação Aberta, or Open Education Group here. I've had it over five or six years. And everything that my students create, all of the content that they do over time, I keep collecting here. And they work together as they would with a, a Wikipedia article. So uh, in, in, in the, same, the same benefits you would get from, from a, a Wikipedia article, you would get from, from here. So you could see, for example, the history of this document, everyone that edited it, how much they've edited it, what do they do? You get all the benefits of tracking this content and modifications and versioning, all of the kinds of things you would get from, um, from Wikipedia, but you get it on a space that's very much um, uh, friendly towards having students and having people work together. So you can just create your own group here and uh, immediately you can start having this sort of collaboration uh, on, 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 this, uh, on this, uh, this space. So much more flexible than, than you would get on, uh, on the, say, a Wikipedia. So if you like wikis, this is a good thing to do. I'll give you one example of something that I've done that I think is really kind of, kind of neat. I've had students read this, this book by this author. You can see his picture over there. It's called Sergio Amadeu. Um, students did this collaborative uh, editing of, of like a summary of the, of the book by chapter. And then I, I shared this with the author. The author came back and did a little video for the students, thanking them for the review and saying it was a good review. And now we have all of this stuff in the same place and everybody can see it. And it becomes something that can be improved over time. So when my next class comes in, they can go to the wiki, they can add to that content. And I have a track record of, you know, five, six, seven classes that have gone through this content of everyone that's participated in making this content visible. It makes really uh, a really nice space for people to feel like learning is a process, like Nick mentioned, that we're doing together, that it lasts a long time, that people can contribute to each other. And so you, you have this really kind of beautiful track record of these collaborations. So people, students stop thinking about this is my work, but this is how I'm contributing to an overall larger work that in the end is going to be beneficial to everybody in the future, right? It's going to be something that's public and available for everybody. I really do encourage you to play around. And this is a really safe space, uh, Wikiversity, that you can do that. One of the things that people are most, now switching a little bit, one of the things that people are most concerned about uh, when they think about um, moving away from large platforms is, is everybody uses Google Docs, right? I mean, Google Docs is kind of a ubiquitous thing. And in the spirit of what I was mentioning earlier, Google Docs is not only not open source, but it's also part of a, a big tech corporation that offers these services for free, but not openly. They're free because they really benefit from collecting your data. So one of the ways you can move away from this, and I've done this with students as well, is, uh, is using other platforms. And one of them, I think the most, one of the most robust platforms that you can use is, is OnlyOffice. OnlyOffice is also free and open source. It's, uh, it's a space you can have your own uh, free, small free account online. If you choose to pay, it's not a, a very unreasonable amount. It's actually quite, quite cheap. And you can have a, a space where students can work in the regular splare sheets, documents, presentations, also uh, collaboratively by moving away from large platforms like Google. You can try to use something like OnlyOffice. It's, it's a really uh, interesting uh, alternative for you to try. If you haven't at least tried it, um, when somebody asks you next time, you know, does, does an alternative to Google Docs that's free and open source exist? Well, now you, you know it exists and you can try it out. And if it works for you, it's, it's a way to, to move away from, from large uh, platforms that, that are, are, are not uh, aligned to these principles. Finally, for, for publishing, uh, I'll go through, I think, two more examples and then I'll go to some more productive tools. Uh, a, a really kind of fun platform that I, I find that people don't know a lot about is PubPub. So if you've, uh, if you've used something like WordPress in the past, um, uh, let me put PubPub here. <coughs> if you use something like WordPress to publish your, your web pages, this is a, WordPress is a very common tool, you'll find PubPub to be quite, quite friendly. It's also an open source tool, but it's more related, it's more focused on collaboration. So if you want to publish something more substantial, like a book or a guide, uh, and you want to do this with students, you want to do it with peers, you want to do it together, um, and you want to have control over versions, and you want to use different types of media, and you want to have people comment and discuss while you're doing it, PubPub is great, um, and, and it's a really great tool to experiment with. 
uh, somebody is, in, let, me, let me check the chat real quick here, it's, uh, challenged by an institution. I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so pop-up is a really great tool and you can create some pretty sophisticated documents. I, I like this example, which talks about fermentation and what you can do with fermentation. It's part of this, uh, the North Carolina State University Library Project. And this is a, you know, a pretty nice uh, web page with information on, on fermentation and things like this, just like you would see with any other web page. But what's behind it, which is kind of cool, is this idea that using these tools in, in the background, they're, they're all related to this idea of collaboration, putting people together in the same space to do and create content together. Right? And of course, being free and open source is, is our focus. So PubPub, also a very cool place to, to, to try things. I'll finish this, this little cycle of, with Omeka, and then I'll, I'll try to go to the chat for some, some questions very quickly. Omeka is a really well-known platform for developing digital libraries. So if, you're, if your focus is not, say, creating text together, which was you know, Etherpad or Wiki, Wikiversity, or it's not creating documents like only Office, and you're not creating something like a web page with a sophisticated web page with PubPub, but you have a collection. You have images or videos or documents that you're curating. You want people to curate and organize a collection of documents, like a, a digital library. Omeka is a really, really great tool, and it's I think one of the few digital libraries I know that works really well if you, if you're just one person doing it, or if you're a small group of people and you don't have a lot of technological knowledge. Uh, you can install it on almost any server, or you can even pay a very small amount to have a plan. But uh, curating resources can be a really powerful activity. And so I've, I've done this, say, with students when, when, people, when students wanted to learn the history of, of the city. Uh, we would go out and do uh, tours in the city and take photographs of, of key places in the city. And we would build a collection together, for example, and we put it online for other people to have access to. And so you can have really cool uh, uh, curatorial experiences, right? To share resources openly with open licenses. So this is uh, Cleveland Historical. It's, uh, it's a site for the history of Cleveland and you can, you can see how cool this could be. The map isn't loading, but it has a map. Uh, you can take a tour of different places. You can organize this with, with public. You can search for, for content um, based on, on keywords and you can do all sorts of really cool things, but it allows you to create a, a catalog of things. One of my, my favorite projects, I think this is from Italy. It's the Museum of Refused and Unrealized Art Projects. It's really kind of a cool idea. Uh, it's one of those ideas you wish you had. And you can see, uh, you can see this a very simple web page with a curation of, of, of content. Then you can see specific things like this image here, and you can have all the things that you need for, for a repository of content, title, description, creator, type, the rights holder, all of this information. You can even add maps to show where things are. And it's quite easy to use. You don't need a lot of, um, a lot of experience to create your own collection. So again, if you're interested more in putting content in a collection rather than creating it from scratch, this can also be a very cool collaborative space to create content using, using Omeka as well. Um, now, before I talk, uh, <laughs> before I talk about the next, let me see if I can, should I go Maka through the questions or would you rather me finish and do that later? I think you have some excited people you might want to take a look into the, to the okay. chat because you might have found some new students. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I saw one uh, challenge from the institution. I think, see, so this is, this is, uh, I think that most institutions are, for the benefit, I think, of people like us, and I'll put Maka and Nick together with me without asking them, but people that want to kind of experiment and challenge and innovate, not, not to be cool, but to try to think about these issues, is when you, you, you will have to challenge what's institutionally devised. Because it, it is this idea that, that the institution thinks for a large, very large group of people and makes decisions for you know, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people, but not for the specifics. I think a, a, a very modern institution would really start to acknowledge that these kinds of things should happen, that teachers and professors and will definitely branch out to using and making use of other tools. Um, but I don't think that's the, that's the default. I think most of these things end up not even challenging, but they're just not visible, right? Uh, and it's more comfortable for everybody that it's not visible. It just kind of happens. But I hope that in the future, one of the things that universities will do is start recognizing that these 
these tools are important and we'll start not only acknowledging them, but also recommending specific ones, ones that are free and open, that respect digital rights and things like that. And not, not how it is today, which is, well, just use whatever you want and that's fine, which is a big problem, right? I think, at least at least for me. Um, so I didn't put anything that's a, a learning management system. So none of this is Moodle. None of this is, uh, I'm assuming that you might have, if you want to have a learning management system, and Moodle is great because it's also free and open source, but none of this is related to management or, 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 or organization. It's more of producing, authoring together, right? And Moodle can integrate some of these tools, but it doesn't do this. It does something else entirely, right? Um, all right, I'll keep going because I'll have just a few more, and then I think we have only 15 minutes left, so I don't want to go over time. But these are, I'm gonna be very quickly because some of you might already know this as well. So now if you're, if you're interested in actually creating content, right? Um, you're creating in terms, of not, not just textual content, but video, audio. Um, I think there's some things that I cannot avoid mentioning. And one of them is uh, if you're creating audio content, the default tool is a free and open source tool. Audacity is, is yeah, what everybody uses. I mean, it's simple, it's easy, it works really well. It's been around for decades and it's, Fantastic to create what everybody has been doing during the pandemic, which is podcasts, including me. Um, uh, so if you're creating podcast content, if you're using multiple tracks, uh, Audacity is is just uh, something that most people should should at least try because it's it's um, it's it's absolutely great. Another really great tool for video creation is OpenShot. And a lot of, a lot of students like to create content on, on uh, cell phones, and sometimes it works out really well, but. Uh, OpenShot is free and open source, multiple tracks, all that kind of stuff as well that you would get for a more sophisticated editor, but very easy to use, very easy to use. And um, and I, I really like using this with students, particularly those that say, I don't know how to edit video. And, and they just do very simple things on their cell phone. When they start using OpenShot, it becomes uh, a very easy task for them to to uh, to engage in. So it's it's a great, great open source tool for for creating videos. Um, and lastly, in this, in this vein, if you were in the pandemic and you did videos um, or, or lectures of yourself talking and you had the screen sharing and all that kind of stuff, you probably were using OBS Studio. I mean, I, it was one of those software that I think most people didn't know until the pandemic and then everybody was using OBS to do streaming and all sorts of kinds of things. So if you're a lecturer and you want to record your lectures, you want to record slides or you want to stream something for some reason, this is also kind of the platform and it's it's not a decision of whether you should use a commercial platform or this you will probably end up using this because that's what everybody uses it's also an open source free and open source solution that allows you to do these kinds of screencasting recording of lectures and, and things like that which is uh which is great um so let me stop with that i think i'm going to stop with this and i'm going to go straight to one last thing which is uh, where do you share this stuff? Because we only have 10 minutes left. And um, so one of, the, one of the places that I think people know about but don't generally use as well as like Wikipedia is the Internet Archive. Uh, and most people use it to, to find things if they know about it. Or they'll use it because of the Wayback Machine because the Wayback Machine allows you to see old pages from the Internet from the 1990s and things like this. If you haven't used the Wayback Machine, it's a really cool thing to do is to look at what web pages looked like in the past and way in the past you can see uh, snapshots of, of web pages you can see the you know the first web pages in the 90s if you wanted to to see what the web looked like but the internet archive is a massive repository of open content massive video audio text and you can create your own channels there so a lot of one of the bigger challenges that we have is is if you want to share your content openly is where do you do it Sometimes if you do it in the institution, you have to do it in like a Moodle platform and it's closed only to your students or you have large files, you don't know where to put them. The Internet Archive is a great place and uh, I don't use it as much as I want to, but I have, for example, I mentioned this, this podcast thing I did with students and we have this sort of repository here of all our podcast content and <clears throat> students can access and, and find the content and put their content here and you can use open licenses for, for the content as well. And it's a great place, particularly for audio and, 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 and podcasts, but well, for video, for files, for images, whatever you'd like. And it keeps all the metadata organized. 
It converts into open formats that people can download very easily. Uh, it's a great place for content, to upload your educational content, to make it available for other people as well. So I rushed a little bit. I had a little bit more, but I think that's enough. It's, it's, it, it, this, the purpose of this is not one of those convergent lectures. It's divergent. It's supposed to kind of give you ideas and links and things for you to look at and find what might be useful to you. Uh, that list that I mentioned in the beginning, um, I'll put it back up here. Let's see if it's, oh, I closed it. No, here it is. Uh, if you find things that you are uh, using that you think are cool and you like to share with other people, this is a thing I keep open, and I'd be glad to, to hear about your, your uh, suggestions. Uh, in the end, I think to bring it all together, what I would encourage you is, is as, as an educator, pay attention to the kinds of tools you're using. Be selective. Be attentive. Before suggesting something to your students, make sure that it... It, 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 as much as possible, it's not just a free tool that will leach data from your students. Try to look for free and open source tools. Tell your students what this means. What does it mean to be an open source tool and why you're selecting that tool? Make them understand that selection of technology and the choices we make with technology are really important to pedagogical practice. And if we can do that, I think we'll make this entanglement between education and technology much more visible to students. And that's, that's I think, a, a really important message for, for the world we're living in today. So I'll stop. Thank you very much again, Maka. And I'll take a look at the chat and I'll try to answer by text uh, as well. Uh, so I'll try to moderate a bit here. Uh, while you were talking, Tal, there were some, this is the most important because tools are something that is very important in these practices. And there were several important issues. The MOOCs, which I try to answer the formal side of it because sometimes it is used as a formal because it issues certificates that you can use and then the dropout rates from MOOCs and I said that uh, it's something that we are not discussing anymore because we understood that MOOCs are not for formal education we cannot treat them as, a, as such then uh, there was uh, some, again, Matilda and others, there's a, a lot going on here. First of all, how do you check copyright issues and what are the downsides of open source uh, tools? Like well, what would you consider as downsides? There are two things that I picked up. So you could also take a look in the chat. Okay. So uh, I wouldn't say there are downsides to open source software because um, there are, uh, the question was, are there any issues to take into account with the open source software? So oh yeah, sure. issues could be considered as downsides or some other issues. Sorry. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things I don't like to do is to make, make the discourse that because you're using open source, you're solving all your problems. That's, that's not the case. It's, it would be the same thing as saying just because you're using an open educational resource, it's naturally better than a traditional resource. That, that doesn't make any sense. I think what, what the, thing, the thing is, is if you compare, uh, the, if you look at the world today compared to maybe you know, 40 years ago, there are many open source solutions that are better or at least as good as closed source solutions. And then it becomes very hard for an educator to justify using a closed source solution because then the benefits of open source are clear. If, it, if it's a stable, well-designed, organized, documented, supported solution, then for, if you are more of an open educator, then it, it, it's very difficult to justify using a proprietary format. So I come from a place where software is, well, software is very expensive for everybody, but I come from a place where people can't afford software, right? So if, you, if I create content where I'm asking my students to, or I create a, an educational uh, uh, opportunity or a class where I'm asking my students to pay for software, for example, where they have to use a proprietary software, that's a problem, right? It's an access issue. Um, if I am asking students to just go online and go to do, go to the uh, the site and put their information in because I, it's more convenient for me, that's a problem, right? If I ask them to download an app because I found this app on on Google Play and it, it's free and I never check the permissions on how much data that collect, is collecting from my students, I think that's a problem, right? Yeah, we can't be that callous about the tools that we recommend, and so the chance that an open source, a free and open source solution will do these kinds of things is much smaller, not only because of the principles of open source, but because there are a lot more people looking and they can see what the code does, right? So I think it's, it's, it's not that it's, a, 
it solves all of the issues with, with, with privacy, with, with quality, but, but the chances of, of you being wrong with a stable, well-developed open source solution are much, much smaller. I, uh, I think your microphone is off. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so then copyright issues was another question. And then uh, you can still write some of the burning issues that you have. We have some six minutes still until the end of the <laughs> webinar. Uh, so how to solve the copyright issues? Like, um, I'm not sure exactly what, what's meant here, but. So in, in, in general, uh, it doesn't really matter. In, in principle, it wouldn't really remember. Uh, it wouldn't matter what tool you're using to create the content. And once once you create the content, yeah, then you, you have to have licensing issues, which would which would mean, um, say, you create a content on on a, a video content with whatever software you'd like, and then the copyright issues begin. Like when you have an actual instance of a video yeah. or a lesson or something else, yeah. and then. Then you get to the realm of open educational resources, and you get into the realm of of licensing, and and here, what in aligned with these principles, the idea would be for you to use open licenses, and of course, the most common um, licenses in this space are Creative Commons. Uh, and if you're interested in open educational resources, there are a bunch of of really great courses online. And I think uh, Bridges Project also talks a little bit about this. Yes, um, yes, yeah, we do, we do. Yeah, it's in perfect. the MOOC. Yes. And uh, if needed, we can cover in the next webinars also this part, uh, the copyright issues, the how to use the Creative Commons. But everything that you need to support the teaching and learning with tools is discussed in the MOOC. Like so, yeah. all go overall. to the MOOC. It's a great place to go. There. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna give you we, the link again. Yeah, and then, and then you solve those issues. But one thing that's important to remember is is also that people don't think about is when you use free tools. So I say you use uh, Powtoon to create uh, uh, animated content. A lot of people think that they can do things online with Powtoon or whatever other software that they're using and use all the cool images and all the cool designs. And then they can take it and use it wherever they want and do whatever they want with it or share with somebody else or remix it. And you don't own those images, right? You, that, then it becomes a copyright issue. The, the images, the videos, the things that are part of that stock content on these platforms are not yours. And so... A lot of these free platforms, proprietary and, and free platforms, they don't give you permissions to do a lot of things with the content that you find there. And so, again, then having this ecosystem where you're working with open educational resources and you're working with open source software gives you a lot more control over everything that you're doing. It might not be an issue for a lot of people. Sometimes you just want to create a little Powtoon and share, and that's fine. But if you are interested in creating this space where you have open licenses, open source, you can share, you can remix, you can create this kind of culture, then these issues come, come to the fore. Yeah. So uh, here is another question, which is about more pedagogy. So uh, as a lecturer in electrical and uh, electronics engineering, I'd like to understand how teaching in a class can be improved for both online uh, and in class. So you mean synchronous teaching, um, I understand we need to be interactive, technology supported, but it's not always possible. So um, I, I will try to answer to this question. So here we have, when we use tools, we need to have some infrastructure in place. It's very important, that's the basics, right? And then we need to understand, yes, interaction is very important, but it also depends on the, what kind of uh, theoretical uh, paradigm you are using. Uh, we uh, discussed it, but also what kind of pedagogy you are using, if it's active learning, if it's problem-based learning, you have some ideas, and then you have some tools that allow that, but they also go beyond that. They change the practice. For instance, in my class I use, when I see, uh, I plan for specific interventions, I talk about some kind of theoretical concept, and I inbuilt, it can be used either online or in the class, the mentee, or something that you saw just now with uh, Mick. He was trying to engage the audience, right, while presenting. So he demonstrated how you can be slightly more interactive. And this is sometimes more important during the theoretical parts. 
So, but then you have to have access. Uh, and there where you have these open tools which do not have access issues or the payment plans, and then you put together, there is no recipe, a general recipe for anything. It is context-based. This is my uh, idea about, like, uh, there is no recipe that we can give you what exactly to use. It is very context-dependent. So I don't know if uh, Tal has, wants to add something on this. No, I think that's great. I saw another question, which is a really great question. So in terms of, of doing the quality and copyright control. So one of the things, uh, I'll see if I can, okay, I can share very quickly here, just to see, so you can see a real example. Um, so yeah, I think we, we will end up doing a lot of this as teachers in the future. We will end up being quality and copyright control when we want to share things openly. And that gives us a responsibility as well. So I just mentioned in the chat, one of the, one of the things I have to do now, whenever I, I have a course where students have to create content or publish things or do things publicly, right? So, so you're moving away from just using something like Moodle and you want to make things public. This, this puts students at risk because they're visible and it puts you as a teacher, I think, in, 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 in a sense at risk as well because you're making these things public. But one of the things that I do, and I'll see if I can find a quick example here, is, is that I, I, whenever content is created that I think is, is acceptable, I will put a little note uh, that says that I kind of, I kind of approve this this content, right? That it's been reviewed by the teacher. I'm trying to find one that's that's done this way. Um, and this gives me some some control over. Uh, oh, here it is. So here's an example. So uh, whenever I have pages that I that I think have either issues or they have been approved by me, I'll put in the top, for example, in Wikiverse and say this 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 text here. It looks really long. It looks really authoritative. But I say. This needs revision in content or form, and you have to go to the discussion page to see what are the issues that are that are, are remaining. And this does two things. It does one allow, allow people that are visiting to know that, of course, this is a Wikiversity site, and you should expect content that's being developed. But also for the next students or whoever else might just come here, this is what we need to make it better, right? And so this this opens up a little bit of, of space for people to. Um, to, to know that, that it's not perfect content. It's never going to be perfect content. It's student-generated content. Now, when we do more serious things, like you're going to publish a video to Vimeo or you're going to do something more authoritative, then yes, I end up being the guy that says, well, where are all your sources? What are the licenses of everything that you did? Show me everything. But this becomes part of how students actually work. In the beginning, we talk about OER, we talk about licenses and all that, and they, they have to have an audit mechanism for everything that they do to, to tell me what the licenses are. They become aware from the beginning, because in the end, it becomes very complicated to do. Okay. So um, I think that we have reached uh, the end of our webinar. Uh, we will uh, try to send you all of those who signed up. We will use these uh, emails to remind you about the other webinars that will be planned. Also, do not forget to sign up for the MOOC, which discusses all of the things and more than these in the MOOC connects different paradigms also. There is the connectivism discussed. There is cognitive uh, approaches because this is a also very important to be aware of uh, basic things how we learn because this exists uh, and also tools and how to license your content so it's sort of a crash course how to do everything from theoretical practical or other perspectives and uh, you will uh, receive the uh, link to the recording and also we'll try to upload and send you this information. Uh, if uh, tell, we are all for open education, so the resources we created, our presentations, we can share them openly. So you will have a, also our certificates of attendance as a follow-up of this webinar. And we invite for others we will send you the notification about other webinars that we are going to plan. 
uh, I'm uh, so thankful for the engagement. It was very interesting also for me as a the researcher in the field to see this kind of engagement and very thoughtful provoking uh, questions and reflections and it shows how much you engaged you were and interested. So thank you so much for your attendance. Thank you, Tal, and I thank Nick also for his contribution, uh, even though he's not here anymore. So see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.